History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, uh, Lecture 18, on Interpretation, the Concept of Progress, Part 4, January 21st, 1965. I should like to begin by finishing off as quickly as possible my observations on the concept of progress. These concerned, as I expect you will recall, the question of the part played in progress by spirit and, in particular, the much-noted fact that the role of spirit in progress does not mean that we can simply assert that the products of the spirit have just got better and better. The fact that such an assertion would be highly dubious in the arts scarcely calls for comment, and, in any case, the point has been made with great force by Hegel in the aesthetics. As far as philosophy is concerned, simply in order to point out the problematic nature of such notions of progress in philosophy, I go no further than, than inviting you to consider, if you know anything at all about logical positivism, whether we can speak of progress in philosophy from Hegel to Carnap. On the other hand, and I said as much to you last time, spirit, by virtue of its own ideas about eternal, unchanging verities, a preoccupation that has never really vanished from the idea of mind ever since Plato's time, has developed a certain static aspect that has repeatedly shown itself in a reluctance to engage with its own evolution. And this aloofness has never, has even deeper causes. Spirit is the most susceptible, and if you like, the weakest, frailest link in the chain of being. It is particularly prone to the temptation to put itself at the disposal of rulers, and to reproduce existing circumstances. But also, and this is perhaps a far graver cause for concern, under that spell it tends to become impotent, ephemeral, and feeble. It is this that largely prevents it from evolving the way spirit ought to evolve. Thus, spirit is said to have as part of its definition the, the ability to soar, as naive people put it, in other words, to rise just as Plato's enthusiasm envisaged instead of staying put under the spell of conditions as they are. But as matters stand, spirit finds itself constantly paralyzed by this weakness. It lacks the courage to follow its own nature and, instead, remains imprisoned in the spell of existing circumstances. Let me, remi let me remind you of the implications for spirit of its function in established academic activity. Let me remind you of the thought control practiced by the professional guild in so-called academic philosophy, to remain in the narrow confines of our own, our own subject. Think of the resentment towards the imagination, and indeed towards anything that floats freely, that sets itself apart and refuses to join in. What this led to was that even the most subaltern representatives of the discipline imagined themselves superior to Nietzsche, at a time when he had already written Zarathustra, Zarathustra and they prevented him from taking up a teaching post in Leipzig. I mention only the most egregious and thus little-known example of such incidents. This will enable you to understand readily that, while spirit is the medium in which you would actually expect to see progress, the reality is that we see astonishingly little of it precisely because spirit is enmeshed in contemporary society and is forced to fulfill a function that conflicts with its own nature, namely to reinforce society in its current form. It renders itself suspect as soon as it raises any protest. Its suspect nature is not just the invention of hostile outsiders. The weakness that prevents it from being different and raising itself above the present penetrates to the core of its being. In countless scholars, for example, it takes the form of their endorsing uh, the expectation, quite, quite without being invited to do so, that their activities should continue a tradition, even when this tradition has proved to be sterile in the extreme, as is the case in many of the humanities. Another aspect of the thought control of the spirit is that it is constantly expected to prove its grasp of facticity. Spirit is supposed to be an authority on demonstrable facts something that is quite alien to the whole concept of spirit, since spirit is defined as something other than mere fact. A task of criticism that would be well worth the trouble of undertaking would be to show just how little spirit contributes to progress.
This is not just in the sense that there are so few progressive minds or intellectuals, for the number of so-called progressive people in general is extremely small, and it is a mistake to identify intellectuals with progress. But above all, we need an explanation for the fact that the actual content of spirit, that is to say, what it produces, turns out to be so hidebound and in great measure so sterile as, it, as is, in fact, the case. If what we call cultural criticism is to have anything more than an elitist and reactionary meaning, this meaning must consist in exposing these aspects of spirit, in showing just how little of its own substance spirit contributes to that progress by way of resisting it, of fighting free of it. As the repository of everything that progress may be over and above all progress, spirit stands at an angle to the progress that actually occurs, and this does it credit. Through its less than wholehearted complicity with progress, it proclaims what progress really amounts to. And, if I may correct and make more specific what I have already said to you, it goes without saying that spirit also participates in progress insofar as it is, as its preeminent organ, implicated in the process of dominating nature. Thus, in art, too, we can assuredly speak of progress in the measurable sense, Moreover, that we can talk about the astonishing progress made in the mastery of the materials used in the different arts. However, there is no direct relationship between the progress involved in the mastery of the materials of art and the quality of particular works. In certain circumstances, the two may even be in conflict with each other. However, wherever we have reason to say that the conscious spirit progresses, it means that spirit is taking part in the domination of nature. And this happens because instead of being chorus separated off as it imagines, it is in fact entwined in the life process from which it had parted company in accordance with the law of that process. All progress, I said earlier, in cultural spheres is that of the mastery of material, of technique. The truth content of spirit is not indifferent to this. A quartet by Mozart and we have to state this so that what I have been saying to you does not appear too crude and undifferentiated. These matters are highly complex, and it is not my task to conceal these complexities from you, but rather to help you to understand them, and as far as possible to articulate them so that they shed their bewildering aspect. A quartet by Mozart, then, is not merely better made than the works that preceded his stylistically, in other words, the symphonies of the Mannheim School. But because it is better made and more consistent, it also ranks higher in terms of value. On the other hand, it is questionable whether the discovery of perspective means that the painting of the High Renaissance is intrinsically superior to the works of the so-called primitives. We may ask whether the greatest works of art may not be the product of a situation in which the mastery of the material is imperfect, or as yet inadequate, in which something is produced for the very first time. Something that makes its appearance abruptly and that fades away as soon as it turns into a readily available technique. Progress in the mastery of material in art is by no means identical with the progress of art itself. However, if the gold background had been defended against the introduction of perspective in the early Renaissance, that would have been objectively untrue, as well as reactionary, because it would have been contrary to what its own logic called for. The complexity of progress reveals itself only in the course of history. That is to say, only with hindsight, only with when you have followed the logic which you cannot escape, do you realize that this coercion is not identical with an improvement in absolute quality, and that you cannot just call a halt to it. A la longue, a la longue, what in all likelihood will assert itself in the afterlife of works of the spirit is what I have called their truth content, in other words, their quality as opposed to technical facility. This even takes priority over the stage reached in the mastery of the material that they have achieved for their own age. But even this ability to take priority to prevail is only possible in the course of a process of a consciousness that is progressing. The idea of the canonical status of Greek antiquity which still survived even in dialectical thinkers such as Hegel and Marx, is not merely an unresolved vestige of the cultural tradition, but for all the dubiousness surrounding the cult of Greek civilization, 
it is still the product of a dialectical insight. In order to express its contents, art, and as I have already indicated, not only art, but also philosophy, must inevitably absorb the growing domination of nature. This means that it secretly works against the very thing it wishes to describe, namely a condition beyond that of the mere domination of nature. It distances itself from the very things that, using neither words nor concepts, it upholds in opposition to the growing domination of nature. This may explain why the apparent continuity of so-called intellectual developments frequently breaks off, often indeed with a misconceived slogan of a return to nature. I have tried to offer something of an explanation in the introduction to the sociology of music, of the ways in which social factors are connected to disruptions in the continuity of historical developments, and I would like to refer you to this. The blame in this instance lies in the fact that, in addition to other, above all, social factors, spirit panics at this contradiction in his own development, that is to say the contradiction between what spirit actually wants and the domination of nature without which it cannot exist. And it attempts vainly, of course, to rectify this contradiction by having recourse to the very thing from which it had distance, distanced itself and which it therefore mistakes for a constant reality. The paradox that progress both exists and does not exist, and that is something I should like to explain to you in these lectures, or rather in this section of the lectures, is one that appears nowhere so vividly as in philosophy, where the idea of progress has its natural home. The transitions from one great philosophy to the next, as mediated by criticism, are or may appear to be compelling, at least during certain self-contained periods such as the 17th century, or at the turn of the 18th to 19th centuries. Nevertheless, to maintain that the evolution from Plato to Aristotle, from Kant to Hegel, or towards a universal history of philosophy, represents progress is highly dubious. Those of you who take part in our philosophy seminars will, will recollect that we kept coming back to the perennial, unresolved disagreements between Kant and Hegel, disagreements that are not to be overcome in any one-dimensional manner. The same idea could be extended to all great philosophies, where we see how a price has to be paid for every advance, and where for every problem that is solved, another has to be allowed to fall by the wayside, something that is always made plain wherever we can talk of thinking in an authentic sense. The blame for this should not be sought, as one might easily suppose in Schopenhauer's well-known dictum about the conversation of great minds across the millennia in the allegedly unchanging nature of the subject of philosophy, of true being, a notion which has now vanished from the history of philosophy forever. Nor is it possible to defend a purely aesthetic view of philosophy that would place a greater value on imposing systems of thought or the ominous-sounding great thinkers than on the truth that is by no means identical with the intrinsic coherence and rigor of these philosophies. To assert that the advances made by philosophy simply lead it away from what the jargon of bad philosophy designates as its true concern would be completely pharisaical <coughs> and misguided. We find a judgment of this kind in Heidegger's philosophy, where the entire history of philosophy is devalued, as if it were the expression, to use a newfangled phrase, of one long obliviousness obliviousness of being, and as if philosophy had only recently succeeded in remembering it. This meant that the need for philosophy to concern itself with specific questions, such as the question of that ominous-sounding being, would become the guarantee of its truth content. In reality, however, in a discipline whose limits are set by its theme, that of limits, the unavoidable and questionable instances of progress are posited by the principle of reason, without which philosophy cannot be thought, because without that principle, no thought at all is possible. It is the Hegelian fury of destruction which hurls one concept after the other into the abyss of the mythical, just as the Sphinx had been dashed to pieces by the word man. <coughs> Philosophy thrives in symbiosis with science. It cannot part company with science without lapsing into dogmatism and ultimately without regressing to mythology. Its substance should be the articulation of what has been omitted or cut off by science, the division of labor or the forms of thought governing the business of self-preservation.
For this reason, the progress of philosophy simultaneously recedes from the goals towards which it would be progressing. The power of the experiences that it registers is enfeebled. The more it is ground down by the machinery of science, or else these experiences are left floating like glob globules of fat in the watery soup of a scientific philosophy. The moment of philosophy as a whole is that of the pure self-sameness of its principle. It is constantly achieved at the cost of what it is supposed to comprehend and can comprehend exclusively by virtue of the reflection upon itself, which would force it to abandon the standpoint of pig-headed immediacy, or what Hegel termed the philosophy of reflection. Philosophical, philosophical progress dupes us because the more tightly its arguments are interwoven and the more compelling and, and unassailable its statements become, the more it turns into identity thinking. It spins a web around its objects that leaves fewer and fewer gaps for everything that is not itself. In this way, philosophical progress presumptuously forces itself on our attention at the expense of its object of inquiry. In the last analysis, in tune with the genuinely retrograde tendencies of society, it seems that the progress of philosophy is forced to pay the price for having not been much of a progress at all. To assume that the journey from Hegel to the logical positivists, who dismiss him as obscure or meaningless, has been progress is simply laughable. Not even philosophy is immune to such regression, whether into pig-headed scientism or the denial of reason, which is certainly not a whit superior to the much derided faith in progress. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, I may perhaps take this opportunity to say to you that what I have been telling you in the, in the context of the philosophy of history, one which focuses on the so-called history of ideas, seems to me to lead quite clearly to what we might well think of as the, prog the program for our philosophy today. According to this program, philosophy might achieve through reflection on its own activity the consciousness that could lead it out of this web of delusion in a non-arbitrary manner. Instead, by using its own methods, philosophy would be enabled to understand the ways in which it is embroiled with forces that are in conflict with what it truly desires. In this sense, philosophy is literally in the same situation as Baron Munchausen when he succeeded in pulling himself out of the mire by tugging at his own pigtail. Well, there are very many philosophers who act in this way without reflecting much on it. They deal with the problem of actual existence by turning existence itself into an ontological category. And this enables them to sidestep the issue. You will perhaps take it on trust that I don't see the matter quite so simply. What is at stake is that given that philosophy is faced with the challenge of transcending itself, if I can put it in this somewhat portentous way, this task <clears throat> should not simply be reflected on but should really be carried out rigorously through the medium of thought. This is a task that really makes you rack your brains, and I do not know whether it can be satisfactorily solved. But anything less than that would really amount to no more than going through the motions, and seems to me to be quite meaningless, even though such thinking may imagine itself to be fantastically metaphysical, and God knows what else besides. <clears throat> Bourgeois society created the concept of progress, and the convergence of the concept with the negation of progress originates in the principle governing society, namely the principle of exchange. Exchange is the rational form of mythical, eternal sameness. In the tit-for-tat of every exchange, each act revokes the other. It's a zero-sum game. <clears throat> if the exchange was fair, then nothing has happened. Everything stays as it was. People are quits. Things are just as they were before. At the same time, the assertion of progress, which conflicts with this principle, is true to the extent that the doctrine of tit-for-tat is a lie. It always was a lie, and not just since the so-called capitalist appropriation of surplus value in the course of which the commodity of labor power is exchanged for the costs of its reproduction. For one of the parties to the transaction, the more powerful party, 
always received more than the other. Thanks to this injustice, one that has been codified as early as Aesop's fable about the lion, something novel takes place in the course of the exchange. The process that proclaims its own stasis becomes dynamic. We might say then that progress originates in the fact that the justice that amounts to a repetition of sameness is unmasked as injustice and perpetual inequality. The truth of the expansion feeds on the lie of the equality. Social actions are supposed to cancel each other out in the overall system, and yet they do not. Where bourgeois society satisfies the concept it cherishes of itself, it knows no progress. Where it knows progress, it sins against its own law in which this offense is already present. And with this inequality, it perpetuates the wrong that progress is supposed to transcend. This wrong, however, is also the condition of possible justice. The fulfillment of the contract of exchange, whose terms are constantly being broken, would converge with its abolition. Exchange would disappear if the objects exchanged were truly equivalent. Genuine progress is not simply quite different from exchange. It would be exchange worthy of the name. Marx and Nietzsche were agreed on this, despite being at opposite ends of the spectrum in other respects. Zarathustra proclaims that man will be freed from revenge, or rather, he does not proclaim it. He preaches that man shall be freed from revenge. For revenge is the mythical prototype of exchange. As long as domination persists through exchange, the myth will continue to prevail too. The, the intertwining of sameness and the new in the exchange relation manifests itself in the ima imagos of progress, in the maybe the images of progress in bourgeois industrialism. What seems paradoxical is that these images grow old and that anything new should ever make its appearance at all, given that technology ensures that the eternal sameness of the exchange principle is intensified to the point where repetition prevails throughout the sphere of production. The life process itself freezes into immobility in the expression of eternal sameness. Hence the shock effect of photographs from the 19th and the early 20th centuries. They explode the absurdity that something happens when the phenomenon tells us that nothing more can happen. Their aging is shocking. In that shock, the terror inspired by the system crystallizes into visible form. The more the system expands, the more it hardens into what it has always been. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. What Benjamin called dialectics at a standstill is probably less of a platonizing residue than the attempt to raise such paradoxes to philosophical consciousness. Dialectical images are the historical and objective archetypes of that antagonistic unity of movement and immobility that defines the bourgeois concept of progress in its most general form. Both Hegel and Marx have argued that the dialectical view of progress stands in need of correction. The dynamic that they promulgated is conceived not as a dynamic tout, tout simple, but as one in union with its opposite, with something fixed, which alone makes it possible to read a dynamic in the first place. Marx, of course, dismissed as fetishistic all ideas of the natural growth of society. As against LaSalle's Gotha program, he also refused to make an absolute of the dynamic in the doctrine of work as the sole source of social wealth. Furthermore, he conceded the possibility of a relapse into barbarism. It may be more than pure coincidence that Hegel too, notwithstanding his famous definition of history, failed to elaborate a theory of progress, and that Marx himself, so far as I am aware, appears to have avoided the word, even in the constantly cited programmatic passages from the preface to the contribution to a critique of political economy. The dialectical taboo on conceptual fetishes, the legacy of the Enlightenment's antipathy towards myth during its self-reflective phase, extends to the category that had previously softened up reification, namely progress, which turns out to be fraudulent as soon as it, a single aspect, usurps the whole. The fetishization of progress is identical with its particularity, with its restriction to technique, or more generally to techniques. 
if progress were in fact to become master of the whole, a concept which bears the marks of its own violence, it would cease to be totalitarian. It is no ultimate category. Its function is to thwart the triumph of radical evil, not to triumph itself. We can conceive of a situation in which progress might lose its meaning, but which would not be the same as the universal regression that is allied with progress today. In that event, progress would be transformed into a corrective to that precarious situation, the perennial risk of a relapse. Progress is this resistance to regression at every stage, not acquiescence in their steady ascent. With these words, I bring to a conclusion my remarks on the concept of progress. Perhaps I may add, for those of you who are interested in these matters, that the arguments that I have just put to you and that stem from a lecture I gave two years ago at the so-called Philosophy Congress in Munster, admittedly somewhat more briefly, and without the additional comments that I was able to offer you today, can now be found in the Festschrift for Joseph Koenig that has recently appeared. In the same context, and with particular reference to the dialectic of the static and the dynamic, which I could only touch on here, I may perhaps also refer you to my article on statics, and Dynamics as Sociological Categories, in Volume 2 of the Sociologica. I regret that I have to refer to my own texts. You must take my word for it that I greatly disapprove of the academic habit of telling students about one's own writings in this way. But with increasing age, when one has committed to print a significant portion of the things one has thought, one cannot entirely dispense with such references since what one has to say in a lecture is really no more than a drop in the ocean, which one then attempts to transform into an argument suitable for the printing press. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may use this form of address, which was the way people used to talk in lectures 150 years ago, I am very well aware how old-fashioned it is and do not speak like this out of naivete. I should like now to move on to a discussion of the doctrine of freedom. But here, too, a declaration of intention is not enough. The least I can do is to give you some indication or to remind you of the main points that have led us from the discussions we have had up to now to the problems raised by the concept of freedom. I should like to begin by reminding you that in these lectures, almost without my having been fully aware of this when I set out, the concept that has turned out to be crucial for the theory of history and incidentally also for the theory of progress has been that of the spell. The concluding sentence of the dialectic of enlightenment states that all living things are or seem to be under a spell, and both statements, i.e. that they are under a spell and that they appear to be under a spell, are probably equally valid. This idea is really an unspoken premise, and it could be said that my efforts here and my own philosophical work more generally are concerned with what we, that is to say Horkheimer and I, called a spell and with our attempts to explore this concept of the spell and all its implications. The fact is that once you have experienced such an insight, and let us assume for a moment that it is not quite without merit, it frequently turns out to contain far more possibilities than is evident at first sight, possibilities that reveal themselves only gradually over time. You all know that it is extremely difficult to identify the positive defining features of a doctrine of freedom or of the concept of freedom. To convince yourself of this, I need only point out that today, completely heterogeneous systems, incompatible political systems, lay claim to the concept of freedom for themselves in one way or the other. Even the National Socialists once held a party congress of freedom, which of course was a sheer travesty of everything that might rationally rationally be described as freedom, by which I mean the freedom of individual human beings. This Nazi claim to freedom did not sound as absurd then as it does today, particularly since at at that time, Hitler was celebrating his great triumphs in foreign affairs. What was meant then was more or less the freedom of all those who were held to be ethnic Germans according to the ideology of the day, and who were supposed to join together freely in opposition to the heteronomy of sociopolitical systems imposed on Germany. If for a moment you make the mental experiment, and this does call for some strength of mind, of imagining that this ideology has been more or less well thought through, then the idea of such a party congress of freedom, by which I mean the freedom of the collective, and not freedom from the collective, does not seem so utterly outlandish. 
You will also be clear in your minds about the glib way in which people talk of freedom in the, in the Western world. You will like, likewise be well aware that the limits of individual freedom are very tightly drawn, particularly at points where you would like to test this freedom, simply to see just how free you really are. And finally, as far as Russia is concerned, or the entire Soviet realm, the situation there is just as it, it has been ever since the famous programmatic statements of the theoretician Minolsky, statements incidentally that were formulated while Stalinism still had, held sway. That is to say, the official theory is that of a humanist socialism, which, in theory at least, was in favor of enabling the individual to develop so as to fulfill his full potential. This theory thus retained the idea of freedom that is, that is implicit in such a development of the, of the individual, even though the practice of collectivism directly contradicts the development of individual human faculties. You can see from this example that every positive definition of freedom comes up against the very greatest difficulties, because it has been appropriated by incompatible conceptions. I wish to say that the section of my lectures that I am now beginning will have roughly the same form as the first part. By this I mean that I shall not treat the concept of freedom in its entire breadth and problematic nature. I shall not explore all the substantive political implications of the idea of freedom, tempting though this task would be. Instead, I intend to focus on one single, what shall I call it, antinomian, 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 antinomian point, a single contradictory point. What I have in mind is the question of free will, in other words, the inner freedom of the individual human subject. And this is because I believe that to focus on this particularly difficult problem will enable you to gain a much clearer overview than if I were to pursue the concept of freedom through all the channels of political history from John Locke on. However, I should like to make one point today, at the end of this lecture. If you agree with at least some of what I have told you about history as natural history, about history as spell, and if you are prepared to take seriously what I have also said about resistance, then this does provide a pointer to what might be meant by freedom. For if you agree with me on that point, then freedom is nothing but the quintessence of resistance to the spell that I have been trying to explain to you. I hope to be able to promise you that once I have worked my way into the dialectics of the intelligible character, and thus into the dialectics of free will, I shall return to the assertion that the positive meaning of freedom lies in the potential, in the possibility of breaking the spell or escaping from it.